so you all know the first thing I'm going to be doing when I leave this place, I'm going to get a chocolate molten cake. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was six years old, I used to watch my mom apply henna. Six, seven, I can never really remember. But I used to watch my mom apply henna for brides. It would take her anywhere between 12 to 15 hours. But the end result was always a beautiful story told through the intricate patterns of henna. Thankfully though, we no longer have to use toothpicks and we have these handy cones instead. Definitely makes henna a lot easier and a lot faster while still achieving the same results. Most people, when they hear of the word henna, they almost always think of an Asian bride with her hands beautifully adorned in these rich red patterns. But what people don't picture is something like this. Henna art has a timeless quality about it that's created a universal appeal and kept this traditional art form alive throughout centuries. Can anyone here guess what this style of henna is? Hold on to that thought and I'll come back to that later. So let me tell you a little bit about what henna is. Henna is a flowering plant. It grows in all the hot countries and it's been known to be around for about 5,000 years. Henna is the only plant in the world that creates this reddish brown stain. It's got a natural dye in it. And this dye stains the top layer of your skin for anywhere between a week up to three weeks. Now, due to its various uses, henna has passed from country to country through a lot of cultural interactions. So it makes it very difficult to establish exactly where this art form began. But deep-rooted history shows us that henna has a history with symbolism, spiritual connections and healing powers, like seen in Morocco, Egypt, and Africa, while playing a very important role in India and Pakistan, where henna is associated with the bride's transformation from a young girl to a woman. It's also symbolic of a new chapter in her life. And, of course, body adornment is one of its most common uses around the world. Henna was practiced exclusively by women, traditionally, and the recipes and the patterns are passed down from generation to generation, like they did with my mom and I. She's in the audience today as well. And, you know, as we women love to talk, it comes as no surprise that Western travelers were soon intrigued and drawn to this exotic art form experience during their travels to the Middle East. However, henna remained relatively unknown in the Western world till, er, till around early 90s, till the music video Frozen by Madonna. Does anybody remember seeing her henna at hand in that video? Till, from the 90s till today, henna art has been a subject of fascination and body adornment all across American and European pop culture. And they even have annual henna conferences in the States to learn, to share, and to celebrate this exotic art form. But you know what? I could have never imagined this passion and this hobby of mine to take flight like it did. So let me tell you how it all began. In November 2009, I was invited to have a stall a henna stall at Hong Kong's first ever handmade arts and craft fair. I was very nervous, like I am right now, um, because I couldn't speak the local language. And just as I had feared, my stall remained empty for a majority of the day, till I finally got really bored. I went to the street and I got the first girl and I told her, I'm gonna give you a henna tattoo, a free henna tattoo. She probably thought, who is this crazy lady? But she sat and she got hennaed and her friends watched in complete fascination as the patterns just started emerging. And soon, it no longer mattered that I couldn't speak the local language because henna speaks a language of its own. So that night, I went home, I drew up a poster 
and came up with a name, Sara Tena. Creative, right? <laughs> it was the best I could do after such a long day. <laughs> the next day, went back to Soho and henna colored the streets. It flowed through all the language barriers, through the cultural gaps, as well as the age gaps. <laughs> and after having that experience, I definitely did not want to go back to my full-time job. So I quit shortly after and have since then pursued my passion and made it my personal mission to spread henna awareness in Hong Kong and all across Asia. Now, why is it a mission, you may ask? Henna art knows no boundaries in culture, religious or spiritual beliefs, in age or ethnicity. It works absolute wonders in bridging all differences. So there was my eureka moment, where I suddenly saw the purpose and my life had just became clear. And, oh, let me tell you about inspiration. So, inspiration literally comes from everything. And you know what? There is no better joy or thrill in this world than waking up every morning to do what you absolutely love. I have henna literally everything from the leaves on the ground to the stones, the floors and the sidewalks and the beaches and more floors. And you know what? From the minute I walked in this room, I've been very tempted to henna this Ted sculpture right here. <laughs> I think I'll wait till after my speech so they don't kick me out. Um, but it's not just surfaces and objects that have been touched by the henna magic. Henna art was even portrayed in Hong Kong's first ever henna exhibition, the Henna Warriors. Now, this exhibition sparked a lot of interest in Hong Kong, but it also caused a lot of debates and controversies back in the Muslim society due to its indecent exposure of women's bodies. So it's not always a smooth sailing. And I realized that when you pursue your passion, looking only at the artistic side, you're bound to run into a lot of resistance. But you know you've triggered something powerful when you have such strong, conflicting reactions. Breaking henna from the traditional confinements of the palms and using the entire human body as a canvas that was a risk I took four years ago. A risk that's led me to some of my most life-changing experiences. From teaching henna to local Chinese students in Hong Kong colleges, to henna at high-end fashion events such as Dolce & Gabbana. Yeah, I've even had to henna pregnant mom's bellies while the baby inside starts kicking and getting impatient. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's definitely very uh, memorable. <laughs> and can you ever imagine henna and science working together? Now, for a girl who hated anything scientific during high school, that's why I took the easy art route, I never ever could have imagined that henna art would one day be a visual aid in teaching anatomy to university students. But that just goes to show the beauty and the diversity of this art form. Now, henna art not only educates and inspires, it's also a means of empowerment. Does anybody here have a friend or a loved one who's had to go through chemotherapy? Imagine if you could provide them with just a few moments of positive interaction. Henna Heals, an organization in Toronto, were the first to address this issue, simply by painting beautiful henna crowns on the heads of the patients. I first stumbled across this henna crowns phenomenon two years ago, when I took part in their global henna crowns competition. As a lucky winner, this design was then implemented 
onto the stunning woman with alopecia by their professional artists in Toronto. Oh, let me tell you about this beautiful little girl. So this is Mariam, a six-year-old I met at the Children's Cancer Hospital in Karachi, where she was undergoing chemotherapy in the summer of 2012. I was invited by the hospital at their Eid festival to do henna for all the kids. And while I was applying henna for the other kids, Mariam approached me. When asked if she would like a henna crown, she simply nodded. I started my first henna crown with shaking hands and gulping back tears. It was a very simple affair of flowers and swirls because I didn't want to take too long and I didn't want to cause her any discomfort. But Mariam sat with incredible patience throughout the whole time. And those 20 minutes that it took for me to apply her henna crown have forever left their mark on my heart. <laughs> and her rewarding smile and just her joy as she proudly twirled around the whole room showing off her henna crown it was so infectious, and it brought tears to all our eyes. I'm very happy to say, Mariam is now fully recovered and out of the hospital. Credit, of course, goes to her doctors. But I'd like to think that years from now, when she looks back at that challenging time of her life, she will remember her henna crown with a smile. And she'll remember the joy and the positivity that it brought for her in those challenging times. Which really makes me wonder, why can't henna be used in hospitals worldwide to provide an alternative means of therapy, to provide these patients with a small positive experience during their difficult times? Now, each experience with henna is special and unique. Some, of course, are more rewarding than the others. But your experience with henna also depends a lot on the style of henna that you apply, because the designs vary in meaning from culture to culture. I recently learned about the different styles of henna in the International Henna Competition just four months ago. And it was very, very challenging. So the competition consisted of six rounds. And in each round, we were given a theme. And the hard part was conceptualizing this theme and executing it within 48 hours. So the first few themes were very easy and basic with Indian henna, Moroccan henna, and Gulf henna. Challenges started with round four with Mauritanian henna. Now, Mauritania is not the same as Mauritius. The Islamic Re Republic of Mauritania is home to some of the most skilled henna artisans using the special technique called resist, where they henna only the negative spaces. The results are mind blowing. And this is what inspired this Mauritanian henna necklace for round four. We move from the deserts of West Africa to Polynesia, the islands of Pacific, where symbolism plays a very important role in their life. Now, do you remember this picture from the start of the talk? This style of henna is called Polynesian henna. It's meant to contain supernatural powers, apparently. That is what inspired this henna crown. Now, I knew that if I made it to the final round, my henna piece would have to be about the community, about the support this art has received from all around the world. The final round was Sudanese henna. My vision instantly was to create a communal piece of art because at that time, the situation in Sudan was very unstable. So I wanted this work of art to act as a symbol of peace and harmony. Using three different models from three different ethnicities, the Sudanese Sahelu was formed. The neural connections and henna bonds of unity and harmony, a culture of friendship a circle of friendship and cultures joined by Sudanese henna chains. Now, I want all of you to close your eyes. Come on, everyone, just close your eyes. 
When I tell you to open them, I want you to think of the first thing that comes to your mind when you see this picture again. You may open them. Do you see anything different? This is what the rest of the world saw. In the realm of spirit animals, the lion is known as a relentless fighter in face of life's dif difficulties and challenges. The lion is also a symbol of courage and strength. This piece, therefore, represented and reinforced the fact that we have to connect and join hands and act as one in order to have the strength and the courage to create a change. Now, can you imagine all of this just by using a simple henna cone and having a vision? This piece not only won the international henna competition, but it was also great in delivering the right message by being shared in forums and blogs all over the world. One simple medium, a medium to create and connect, to share, a medium to heal and to empower. Henna, just a simple medium to create the change, even if a small one. Thank you.